Now, um, we need to let you know what's going on before we begin, really. Um, would you like to join me and, and we'll uh, introduce yourself and your crew and then we'll read out the splurge. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Leo. I'm from National Geographic. We're making a documentary and uh, it's on the relationship between AJ and Mary and uh, we're just going to be filming the seminar today and then we're going up next um, next week and actually spending some time in Kangaroo with the guys mm -hmm. seeing, seeing what they're about, what they're doing and it'll go on TV all around the world on National Geographic channels so if you get Foxtel All Star, that's where you'd see it um, so yeah, we're really happy to be here and um, basically if there's anyone that doesn't want to be filmed if they could let me know, we'll be disappointed because we want to be able to film whatever happens here but that's okay, we don't have, we can just avoid you or we can blur your face or something weird like that. Um, uh, is, is anything else you wanted to add? To Do you want me to read out the... Uh... Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I want to introduce you guys, you've got oh, yeah. yourself. Everyone introduce themselves. I'm Noel. Hi, Noel. Hi, Leo. Hi, Leo. And Leo. Hi, Leo. Were you recording all that? Not that bit, no. Okay, you need to record me as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll, just, um, I'll just do that real quickly again, because yep. we need it for our legal purposes on camera. Yeah. So again, we're here for the National Geographic Channel. We're making a show called Taboo. We're going to be filming this. We're doing a story on AJ and Mary. We're, going to we're meant to be Taboo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, basically, uh, we're going to be filming you guys. And if there's anyone that doesn't want to be filmed, if they can let me know, uh, we don't have you don't have to be part of the show. But obviously, we'd like you to be. Um, and just ignore us as well. So we're going to try and we don't want to interrupt what's going on here because we know that there's, there's some serious some serious good stuff happening. And so we we're trying to. We're going to try to be out of the way, but if we do, so you might see us moving around, but uh, please, uh, I hope that we don't impact uh, your experience too much. Um, if I could just make a comment, um, the guys that are like fly on the wall, they're just a bit big flies. <laughs> so if you just please bear that in mind. <laughs> so, and if there's a little announcement that I've got to read out for their legal purposes. Please note that Beyond Productions are filming a documentary which will be shown throughout the world in all media and forever. And if you do not wish to appear in the program, please let the crew members know. So that's the oh, thing. Hi, disclaimer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's done. So how are you today? Nice cool weather today. It's a bit, it was pretty warm this week, I thought, down this way, and then all of a sudden it's become cool. So um, welcome along. I think we've, we've had the heater on for an hour or so, so it should be nice and warm. You want me to just do a clap so that I can uh, synchronise all of our sound and so forth? That's good. Well, what I'd like to talk with you about today is, um, is a continuation of a subject that I've been speaking with people about quite frequently. Um, and I'd, it's more to do with the reminders about how to actually work your way through emotions and also how to work your way through truth. So it's a combination of both uh, subjects, emotions and truth. So let's write on the board what it's about. It's part of the Human Soul series of talks that I've been doing. And this one I was just thinking of calling it something like... Uh, Emotions extended or something like that, but it's actually an overview of emotions is what, what I would like to raise with you today. Now, um, the reason why I'd like to raise that with you, I'll just get a better pen. The reason why I'd like to raise that with you today is that um, what I'm finding in my visits with people face to face is that a lot of people are still finding it very, very difficult to get their head out of the way of what's going on inside of themselves emotionally and to actually recognise fully what's going on inside of themselves emotionally. And we find that what's happening many times is that we get to a point where um, we thought we knew a lot of information and then after a while through our emotional work we get to a point where we realise that all of that stuff we thought we knew, it was only a thought and it wasn't yet a feeling. So what I would like to do first is describe to you how to, to look at yourself in terms of your emotional work, in terms of um, 
getting closer to God and also getting closer to yourself. So remember that this process, the process of receiving God's love, is not just about getting closer to God, but it's also about coming to know yourself fully. So, and, and it's one of the only ways, in fact, that you can ever come to know yourself fully. So let's uh, do a bit of an overview first, shall we? So what are we made up of? We've got our physical body, yes? yes. So let's go. Our spiritual body and our soul. Let's put our soul like that. Or let's just draw it, instead of drawing it like that, I'll draw it as the half of the soul that we actually are. And in this case, it's the man, so just a half of the male, the male soul. The, uh, the feminine part of the soul, obviously, is the other half. So, and the physical body, spirit body. Where is our mind? Okay, so our mind is in the spirit body's mind. The brain in the physical body is just used as a tool for the mind to exercise. So there's the mind. But you notice that um, it's not the soul. It's not you're the real you. The real you is the soul. Now, if you consider that as the general thing, and so, so we do that, the mind of the spirit body for this side is in there as well. So that's the mind. When you use your intellectual reasoning, that's what you're using. Now, the problem that we have on earth is that we get so used to using our mind to do everything that we start at a very, very young age tuning out of our real emotions and, and the feelings that are in our soul. So what finishes up happening is during the times we're growing up, Eventually, our mind overcomes our feelings and emotions so much that in the end, we don't feel our emotions very well by the time we become adults. And a lot of the times, we have no idea what we're really feeling and we've got to sit and let ourselves feel um, before we even can discover what we're really feeling because our mind has been used so much, it's so dominant, that to actually connect back to our feelings is a difficult process. So what, what I would like to do today is to talk more about how emotions work, why this is all very important for, for us to work through if we want to have a relationship with God and a relationship with ourselves. And also we want to speak about um, how do we determine the truth of an emotion or the truth in, in, any, in any form? How do we recognise truth as a part of this process? Because a part of this process, of course, is understanding truth. Now, the reason why we're discussing the emotions, if we can talk about that first, is because the emotions are the beginning of understanding humility. And remember, in the process that we've been describing, you've got humility as your number one quality that we really need to develop if we're going to ever know ourselves and if we're ever going to know God. We need to have humility. Humility opens the doorway to our reception of truth. So truth is the next step, understanding the truth. Now that's not just understanding the truth with our mind. That's actually feeling the truth with our heart. That's a part of the process. So we need to do that. And then once we do that, we can now unblock ourselves to the reception of love. So once... We've opened our heart, which is the process of humility, opening our heart. And then we've opened our heart. Now we have the ability to receive truth into our heart. And once we can receive truth into our heart, the truth helps us come to terms with what is the truth about ourselves and the truth about God and the truth about the universe. And in that process, we can then long for love and receive some. But if we haven't got that openness in our heart, then it's impossible to receive that love anyway. And it's our soul, this part of us here, that is the functional part that does all of this, not our mind. And most of us still usually begin with our mind rather than beginning with our soul. And after you progress on the divine love path for a long period of time, generally you start getting to this point where it switches over or around 
and no longer are your inter no longer are your thoughts the dominant thing in your life but rather your emotions are and you start realizing that your emotions drive all of your thoughts actually and this is why psychologists have come up with this concept of subconscious the reason why they view it as your subconscious driving your actions is because there is a heavy suppression of the emotion and when there's a heavy suppression of the emotion you are now using your mind thinking that you're logical but the reality is that your mind is still being heavily dominated by the emotions that you're suppressing so therefore oftentimes we're not as logical as we'd like to believe in our mind because our soul our emotions which are inside of our soul drive a lot of our experiences still so what we would like to do is understand that becoming humble means becoming humble to what we really feel not what we would like to believe we feel they are two very very different things what we really feel and what we'd like to believe we feel are completely the opposite in many cases so you see this very much when you meet some people who have been in religions for many years they have a very strong opinion about what they are as a character and yet quite often right in that same moment they can be almost as unloving as a murderer can be in fact religiously if you look over the entire world there are many times that religions drive people to murder another person because they're not in harmony with their belief systems now that tells you that their their mind allows them to go ahead with that act and yet if they were connected to their heart they would never be able to go ahead with a murderous act so so there's something wrong there's obviously some kind of discrepancy between what's really going on and what they think is going on and this is what why we need to discuss this subject to quite quite in detail so let's uh, start with that now i'm not suggesting in this discussion that we have to throw away logic in fact my feelings are that god gave us a brain and god gave us also the spirit body's mind which is capable of logical reasoning so therefore it is something that is necessary to be used in the discovery of truth so don't throw you don't want to throw away your mind you want to allow your mind to see what is really within your soul and that's a very very different process than throwing away the intellect altogether so we're not suggesting that you all of a sudden just become a totally emotional being without any mental check on what your actions or or anything might be leading you towards but rather you need to come to terms with three or four primary things with regard to your mind so let's look at with regard to the mind the first one is any intellectual reasoning that you are unsure of you need to just go ahead and experiment so in other words let's say you have a thought let's say during the course of a day something happens and you have a have a thought that you believe that the universe is flat and if you didn't have uh, any other context of which to measure this thought that you've just had and this by the way was a thought that many people had a thousand years ago that the universe and in fact the earth was flat and um, then you would have to put it in the unsure basket because you have no way of proving whether it's flat or not aside from traveling and unless you had the means to travel you would not be able to test the truth with regard to whether the universe or the earth itself is flat and so what you would do with a thought like that because it's a thought that you're unsure of the answer you would put it in the experimentation basket does that make sense so in other words you'd say all right 
I'm not sure what the answer to this question is. So that means I need to do more experimentation with that particular question. So instead of coming up with an idea of, um, uh, you know, that the Earth is flat and then sticking with it, even if it's unproven, what you would do is inside of yourself you'd go, anything that's unproven to me, and it doesn't matter whether it's proven to somebody else, you need, this needs to be related to you. If it's unproven to me, then I need to put it in the experimentation basket. I'm going to experiment with it. Does everyone get that? So any intellectual reasoning or any intellectual thought you have that falls into that basket. So for example, in a relationship, you, the, you might have a thought all of a sudden that your wife doesn't love you anymore. All right? Now there could be a whole lot of things that are not proven about that yet. And you'd need to, uh, and you're unsure of it, so you'd need to put it in the experiment basket. You'd need to put it into this thought requires my attention and requires further investigation. Can you see that? Let's say it's something about the universe. Let's say you were designing an aeroplane, and you were, uh, you know, 200 years ago, when when planes weren't yet invented, and you wanted to come up with some kind of thought that oh, I can definitely create a flying machine, but you'd have no way of doing it. You don't know how. So what you would do is you would allow yourself to experiment. You would build a flying machine. The first one you build probably wouldn't work. So you build another one and you build another one until you start working out how it works. And that's a part of the experimenting process. Does that make sense? Mary, you'd like to ask? By the way, you can ask questions through this. and We'd just like to record your art. Questions. <laughs> so really this is the process that we're in with regards to our soul. We're experimenting with the fact that we... Because it's for we're most of us. We're even experimenting with the fact that we have a soul. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? You, you can't say that when, when, you, when I get up here in front of you and I tell you, look, you've got a soul. You can't straight away say, well, yeah, I believe that. Without knowing for certain through a process of experimenting. Can you see that? So, so we have to experiment with some things if we want to determine the truth or not. Yep. Yep. Okay, so that's number one. And remember this is to do with the intellect. So, so we're not discounting the intellect. We are sta stating that the intellect will often come up with thoughts. Thoughts will be just dropped into your head. Now where they come from is debatable. Now sometimes they come from within yourself. Sometimes a thought gets dropped into your head, you know, you'll be driving along, you've got the, the radio turned on in the car, and, and the presenter on the radio drops a thought into your head. Or you might be uh, home just uh, meditating or something like that, and then all of a sudden um, you have a feeling and a certain thought drops into your head that seems to be related to that feeling. And that, that is one, a thought that I would say would be dropped into your head from a spirit. It doesn't really matter what the thought, where the thought's from. The fact that you're unsure about it, needs that it means that it needs more experimentation. So everyone understand that? That's number one. Okay. Two. Intellectual Thoughts and feeling, thoughts that are harmonious with love must always be retained as truth. All right, if we can turn off those mobiles or whatever there. Um, intellectual thoughts that are harmonious with love must always be retained as truth. So in other words, if you have an intellectual thought and you can see that this thought is very much in harmony with love, then it's something that you should retain even if you don't believe it yet. You need to retain it as truth inside of yourself because it's harmonious with love. In other words, love will tell you what's truth or not. There is a direct relationship between love and truth. So love will tell you what's truth. 
The third thing is intellectual thoughts that are disharmonious with love must be discarded as error. So if you have an intellectual thought, oh, I'd like to murder that guy. <laughs> that's a thought that's popped into your mind. You don't know where it's come from. It might have come from yourself. It might have come from a spirit. It might come from prompting of other people around you. It could come from any source. But it, it's obviously out of harmony with love of the other guy and yourself. So therefore, it needs to be discarded. It needs to be thrown away. It's something that you can trust is not truth. Not something that you need to act upon. Not something that you need to experiment with. Does that make sense to everyone? Very basic. These three very basic principles will help us with to, to, to determine truth if we follow them. All right. So we've got intellectual reasoning that we are unsure of. We need to put it in the experimentation basket. We've got intellectual reasoning and thoughts that are harmonious with love. We need to hold on to and keep, even if we feel the different opposite to it. We still need to hold on to it and keep it. And intellectual thoughts that are disharmonious with love, we need to throw away even if we want to hold on to it. <laughs> we need to throw it away because it's obviously not truth. Because we can measure whether something is truthful or not by, by whether it is loving or not. That's the underlying premise. Dave? Um, usually when we're coming from a place of error, are we going to really know what's loving sometimes? We think it's loving, but then we later on find out it's not perhaps? Or? If you have that suspicion, then I'd say that it falls in the basket number one. Unsure. Unsure. Uh -huh. And if I'm unsure, then I need to experiment further before I know. Mm. Does that make sense? So, so every time, even if we... There are times, I agree, where you think something is loving, mm. but uh, God's got a feedback system, the law of attraction, which will tell you whether it's loving or not, down the track if you embrace it so so um, and to me that falls in the unsure basket i'm not 100 percent positive that that is love or not yet mm. and so i need to experiment with it even from our environment like in a family situation where we think it's right to treat a person a certain way because that's what we've been shown all our life and we have a belief that that's the way it happens yes so the first thing i would do there intellectually is i'd go well you know would i like to be treated that way <laughs> Um, well, if I wouldn't like to be treated the way that I'm treating that mem family member, then it's obviously in the third category and I need to discard that treatment. If I would like to be treated the way that I'm treating that family member, then it has to fall into one of these two boxes where it's either loving or I'm not sure whether it's loving yet. So it really, it um, involves a lot of self-reflection, I guess, doesn't it? And it does. Reaction. It does. Thought, yeah. yeah. The beauty of it to a large degree is initially when you compare these three intellectual thoughts or types of intellectual thoughts, you can usually draw a line along there. In other words, you can say, I don't know yet or I know for certain. Mm. And here you know for certain something is wrong. So, so most of us in our heart would know for certain that murder is wrong or murder is unloving. So therefore we wouldn't take that action. If a murderer was trying to justify a murder, he might not know. So he would fall into this. So he'd have to experiment with it before he actually engaged the action. This is before you engage any action. Does that make sense? If we... um, a that I can see is that... There's a mute button on yeah. it. Sorry. And it's it's Oh, don't worry about the battery. Yeah. Uh, a common problem I see, though, is people seeing something that's loving, but then it's obviously taxing on themselves, and they could leave it as thinking that it's a loving and harmonious thought and go off and be helping all these other people at a cost to themselves. So to me, again, the law of attraction would be they'd embrace it like they think this is true mm. here. They mm. believe they know that it's true here. Yeah. But through their emotional process, which, we, which is what we're going to add to this, yeah, yeah. But through their emotional process, they'll eventually come to see that they feel tired. Mm. And if they feel tired, something's wrong. Yeah. So, so straight away, you know, they know something must be wrong. 
this is only, so far I've only presented half of what we need to do. That's right, maybe I'm thinking ahead a little bit. Does that make sense? So this is half, and this is the intellectual half. Mm -hmm. So here we're focused on the intellectual half of what we need to do if we're going to discover truth. Does everyone get that? But it's not the whole story yet. There's a whole another three things that we need to do at an emotional level to really discover the truth. And we need to put it all together rather than separating it from each other. So... So at the moment, we could be looking at this only from an intellectual point only. You can see that while um, you know, it's going to be helpful, it's not going to be certain, is it? It's not going to have a definite outcome uh, yet. That we need to add things to it before we have a definite outcome. Vera and then Mary. Um, I'm really stuck in my head. Yeah. And... Number one, like it sounds easy, but I, I'm so stuck in so many things, I can't even come up with the right experiments. Like how do you, how yep. do you find the right <coughs> questions to ask to experiment with? To well, each one of these things, I suppose, has a whole extra set of things we can do. But the first thing I would do is pray. Because praying, you're talking to the creator of your own self... And so therefore, anything you're unsure of, the first thing to do would be engage prayer. Remember a prayer being a desire that you have for God, for God to tell you truth. And so if you had a desire for God to tell you truth, then you would need to observe. So the next thing I would do is observe what happens over the next few days of my life. So this is a part of the experimentation process. And we can talk about the experimentation process as a separate issue, I feel. The main thing we need to do firstly is understand what box it goes into. So most of the time, if we don't know what box it goes into, then it's in box number one. If we think that we're being loving, then it's box number two. And if we know that it's not loving, then it's box number three. So it's quite a simple intellectual choice at this point. How to go about experimentation is a different discussion, which we might like put... More information on a bit later after I've presented the other half. Is that all right? Yep. Mary? I was just feeling that it seems like most of the world um, just operates with this set of rules, really, don't we? Yes. We inherit a lot of beliefs, usually from our parents or environment, and th- they, they say teach us this, as is, truth. this is truth, this is loving, this isn't, it's mm-hmm. not loving, and we... We just sort of stick between two and three and most, like before I met you, for example, I didn't even engage my soul in... In an experimentation process. In experimenting. Mm. Even intellectually, I didn't really uh, consider much. There's a main reason why we don't do number one and that is that we are told we're not allowed to make mistakes and number one is all about making mistakes. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, so we're told so much in society and in, in our upbringing that we're not allowed to make mistakes. And so what we finish up doing is we finish up engaging, like not engaging, number one, because we don't even want to admit that a mistake can be made. And so what we do is number two or three. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to say that again? No. <laughs> I, I got it. Yeah. Thank you. But I think it leads to the second part of what I feel for myself is this – you're talking about um, not being able to make mistakes. And I think because of that, every time I engage my soul and I discover something that might not be loving, mm-hmm. I use my intellect to skip over it or mm-hmm. to – to try to force my emotions into what my intellect says is loving rather than feel the uncertainty of it all and the feeling like I could be in error, I suppose. Yes. A lot of people revert to this or this as as a reasoning because they're not prepared to do this. They're not prepared to go through the process of not knowing. They want to know before they begin an experimentation process, right? And, and ex- experimenting with life is essential if you're going to get to know yourself, but it's also essential if you're going to get to know God or anybody else. 
you can't even have a relationship without it being an experiment, really, can you? If you think about it. So, so we need to engage this actively. We need to stop judging ourselves for not knowing, in other words. We need to be happy that we don't know because we can put it in box number one and experiment with the knowledge and by engaging a process that we can talk about in a minute. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Like everyone gets it so far? So we're a, bit, we're a bit in the mind at this point, trying to understand the soul-based process, but it's important for us to understand it. So is there any questions about the intellect here, like the intellectual process up the back there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, we were coming. Oh, Joy wants to ask one. If we go down there and then, then up the back. Thanks. Um, maybe this is in the next part too, but um, I can see that like there are emotions obviously that drive the, I don't want to be wrong stuff, that affects number the, one. There are. But also in number three, I'm kind of stuck on, well, I can't just discard this murderous thought or whatever it is because there are emotions that are driving that as well. Yes, so when I say uh, discarded, um, because it's a thought... You can discard thoughts. Feelings are a bit different. Feelings okay. are a bit harder to discard. Um, we can discuss how to discard them, but they're a bit harder to discard. Okay. Yep. 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 Any other questions up the back there? Yep. yep. I was just wondering whether um, you might give an example. Um, kind of not sure of your context in terms of the first question, the first statement. I'm, so, well, I'm saying that anything you could possibly think of that in the universe that arrives to you as a thought, anything, if you're unsure of the answer, then it goes in the box number one. Okay, it's big. It's so it's big. <laughs> yeah. Anything that you could possibly conceive, right? Mm -hmm. So you pick up a musical instrument. Sit it on your lap and the question you have is, how do, how do I play it? The answer is, I'm unsure. <laughs> so what do you do? You need to experiment. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. What most people do with a musical instrument, they pick up the music instrument, look at it in confusion, and even though they love music, they don't want to go through the process of experimenting and failing and, and making mistakes. And, and so, so the, from the majority of persons, like if I, if I ask an audience generally... Put up your hand if you love music. Almost everybody in the audience generally puts up their hand. Put up your hand if you play music. You see, like there's like one quarter, maybe less, who play music. Now, why is there a discrepancy between the people who love music and the people who play music? It's because the other people have not yet experimented with the playing of music. Does that make sense? It's just that because they're unsure or a lot of things might have happened in their childhood which cause them to feel like they can't really do that or it's not possible or they might have things happening in their life that cause them to feel like it's too hard to go through the process of practising an hour a day to get used to it now because you know, you're busy, you've got a busy life. There might be all sorts of reasons but it really is something that you need to experiment with. If you love music and you don't play it, then why not experiment with it and, and be prepared for the fact that you're going to probably fail when you first start. And in fact, everybody who learns how to play a musical instrument goes through the first, usually first 10 to 20 weeks, is a feeling of failure. <laughs> yeah, almost everybody that you ever hear of learning an instrument, a, as an adult, as a child, they don't worry about that generally so much. They're a bit more accepting of failure when we're a child than we are as an adult. So yes, this applies to everything you could think of and on every subject you could think of in the universe that can come into your mind. So it's a large scope. Okay. Is there any more questions about the intellect? No? So shall we proceed with the emotions? Now, the emotional content of looking at whether something is true or not is almost identical to this. And all we need to take out are the words intellectual reasoning and replace them with the word emotions. So let's, uh, let's do that. So we've got one, emotions that you are unsure of. Uh, the answer to...
we need to experiment with. So that's basically number one. Mary? Are you saying if we're unsure if they're loving? Are you saying if, if we're unsure that they're loving, we're unsure that they're truthful, we're unsure that they... So if I feel like you don't love me... Yeah. ...then, then I need to... But I don't know, is that the truth or is that just a feeling that I'm having? Exactly. Yeah. So okay. you need to experiment. Yeah. So you, yeah. you need to find out the answer to that, like so particularly if we're in a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Interesting example. Yeah. Just, yeah. But so this whole process is really designed to help us discover the truth of everything. Of everything. Yeah. The truth of everything. Which is something that we can discover. Which is something we are able to discover. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. God created a beautiful universe that we're able to discover the truth of on every single subject imaginable. But we have to engage a process. Yep. So number two. So it's basically two is the same as this one. So emotions that are harmonious with love must always be retained. When I say retained and felt as truth. They are the truth. If they're harmonious with love, they are the truth. Diane. Um, when you say must always be retained, you can't actually discard them, can you? When, when, when they I, are harmonious Probably retained isn't the right word I should be using. It's probably just felt, must be felt as truth. So emotions pass through you they don't stay with you as you know in the course of a day you can have many emotions right and 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 in one day you could have loving emotions come up and you can have very hateful emotions come up very angry emotions come up very sad emotions up all in the course of one day and that's because emotions have the ability to pass through you and so you can feel them as they come so emotions that are harmonious with love and must always be felt but they must always be respected as truth as well because they're harmonious with love. Remember, there's this relationship between love and truth. Right? And I'm not just talking about your own truth here. I'm talking about God's truth, like universal truth. So the way we can know whether something is truthful as an emotion is when we're feeling something is if it a, has a love as its basis. So, so is anger a love-based emotion? Uh, some people would maybe say that it is, but it obviously isn't. It always causes somebody pain, usually anger does. So I would say that that is an emotion that is not harmonious with love and therefore you must feel it as error, not truth. So whenever you are angry, it's capable of telling you the truth, but it's not if you live in the anger, if you just live in the anger and become enraged with the world, then it's not going to be harmonious with love and therefore it's not harmonious with God's truth. Right? These things are going to confront some of you as we go through. So let's... Mary? So I'm just interested in what you're saying about anger and truth. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of... I would love for you to describe uh, and I have some experience of observing you do this but um, this is something I still grapple with mm -hmm. but how you you determine truth through understanding love and your other emotions mm -hmm. I watch you do that all the time mm -hmm. can you give an example of how you do that well what say we finish the three yeah. and then yeah. what we, we need to of course merge this together because because if we, if we use our emotions without our intellect, we are going to have certain dangers. And if we use our intellect without our emotion, we're going to have certain dangers. We're not going to be able to determine the truth if we do one or the other. We have to amalgamate the two of them together. Right? So it's very important to understand that what we're trying to do is discover a way here of experimenting and discovering truth ourselves, not having to rely on anybody else in the universe or anybody else on earth 
for the discovery of truth. This is how can we discover truth ourselves, right? So you remember everything that we're trying to teach myself and Mary is how to become self-aware and self-responsible. So you want to get to a stage where you, you don't have to listen to anybody else about what's true or not if you don't want to and still be able to discover truth for yourself. Right? You think about a scientist who's on the forefront of any type of endeavour. He has nobody else to tell him what is true or not. So what does he do? He's unsure when he begins and what does he do? Experiment. He experiments. So scientists are very, very used to experimenting in the physical layer or physical level generally, right? Now there's a whole set of scientific endeavour that could be investigating in a spiritual layer, or, but, but that's not as popular. And what I'm saying is on any layer we need to experiment. So any spiritual layer or soul-based layer we need to experiment with if we are unsure of truth. If we sort of... The way I see life is I sort of see it like a scientist sees physical life. A scientist sees physical life as something to just enjoy the discovery process of. And that's how I see all my life. As something that we can go through the process of experimenting with in every aspect of our life. We're not limited to, to physical life, but spiritual life, our, our love relationships... All of the things in our life that we could ever engage, we can experiment with and find the truth of every single time. That's what I'm saying. Okay, let's put number three just to write it down because I think we know what it is now. So there's emotions that are disharmonious. with love must be released as error. So I have a feeling inside of me of resentment for somebody and that resentment has built now to such a point that I would really like to harm them. Like, I'd, I'd really like to punish them somehow. Like, attack them or, you know, do something to their life that hurts them. Now, obviously, that is out of harmony with love, that feeling. Now, it has to be released as error. In other words, instead of acting upon it as a truth, I need to go, right, it's, it's an emotion that's out of harmony with love, so I need to stop act, acting upon it, and I need to somehow, and we'll talk about how as we go along, I need to somehow release it. I need to somehow get it out of me so that it's not in me anymore. And once it's not in me anymore, it won't define my life anymore. Does that make sense? And once it doesn't define my life anymore, then I'll be free of that emotion and I'll have gotten rid of something inside of me that's out of harmony with love. Yep. So how are we going so far? All right. Question. So... Um, what I have trouble with is if someone's telling me something and yet I'm getting a different feeling than what they're telling me mm -hmm. and then I don't know whether my feelings are wrong or they're telling me an untruth and I just get totally So that falls confused. in the basket number one on this side, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, but then I don't know how to experiment. Experiment. So you, you see, can you see that part of the problem is most of us have got no idea how to experiment. That, that's part of the problem here, isn't it? You see... We're so used to either going there or there every time in our life or being forced to go there and there every time in our life through society and through our upbringing. When, in other words, we've been told what truth is and we've been told what error is and we have given no choice to experiment. Right? That's how we've been brought up, most of us. And as a result of that, we have no idea how to go through an experimenting type of process. And, and we also have a lot of emotional impediments associated with going through a process. Because we hate not knowing, right? usually inside of ourselves. So, so what we do is we try to convince ourselves that we know, even when we don't know. You know, it's like I remember once opening the bonnet of a vehicle and, uh, and, uh, and there was a woman and, and I asked her to point out the battery to me and her father, as a joke, had pointed out the carburetor as a battery to her when she was young, as a joke, and she completely believed that the carburetor was the battery. 
Right? And that's the problem is that how does she correct that error? By only experimenting. But because, we, because she just accepted daddy's word, like a bit of a cruel thing to do as a dad to do. He might have thought it was a joke at the time, but a bit cruel. And, and now she, she was adamant, you know, like that's, that's, the car, that's the battery there. A bit hard to take that battery out and replace it. Um, so, so she needs to experiment. And the problem is, is that most of the people around us do not like us experimenting. Have you noticed that? Yeah, most people around us don't like us to experiment. So, so this is the problem we face, is how do we go about these experiments? Right? Many of us have very large emotional impediments to experimentation. One of the primary experiments that are uh, uh, impediments are that, uh, that we wish to retain the approval of others while we're experimenting. That's one of our primary impediments. So if you imagine the Wright brothers when they were building their aeroplane, having to retain the approval of others while they were doing their experiments, I wonder how long it would have taken them to then achieve flight. A much longer time than it did by them not listening to anybody and trusting their own intellect and experiments emotionally. Right? So every, if you look at every new thing, every new endeavour that has ever been created on this planet, the person who created it was willing to experiment and willing to experiment without the approval of others. Yep. So it's really curiosity, isn't it? Like children are curious, so we uh, maintain yes. that curiosity. So you think of a childlike view of ex experiment. If we focus on that, the first one is curiosity. Yes, now I'm sticking to my own... <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's meant to stop me from tripping over it, but it stuck me to it instead. <laughs> curiosity is a major part of this experimentation process. Yeah? What else does a child do when it experiments? Have you noticed? Oh. Do I? They, yeah. Use your mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, they're much more emotionally open than certainly I am, so... Um, so they, they could feel. you say they are open? They, they're open, transparent. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Non-critical. No, like they just absorb like a sponge. They, they're like a sponge, yeah. aren't they? Enjoy. And they're desirous. They're just. They have desire. Desirous. Yep. Good. Desirous. I write it down. It's, you said it. <coughs> yep. Anything else you can think of that a child is? If we could bring the mic over. I was just going to say they're in awe. They are, they're in awe. They're not sort of like... You know, you know what we do as adults? We hear one sentence and by the time we've gotten to the second sentence, a lot of times we've already made up our mind. That's often the case. A child doesn't do that, do they? They listen to the whole thing generally particularly if they've asked you like uh, how many of you have had children right how many of how many of your children have said daddy daddy how does this work daddy why does that happen daddy why does this happen or mummy why does that go why is this why is that why is this why is that have, have you noticed that when, when they're very young my both of my boys um did exactly that all the time like daddy this daddy that daddy this question 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 so they are willing to ask questions. So this is part of the process of experimenting. Uh, Joy, if, we, if you just show Joy, <laughs> Joy on that camera as well. So you um, they don't have any fear. So they've got very little fear or no fear generally. And if they do have fear, a lot of times it's our parental reflected fear anyway. Yes, Tara? They're very trusting. They trust, yes. They don't... It, it's interesting, this attitude of trust. They don't trust necessarily that the answer is correct. But they are open enough to trust that the person who's giving the answer is being honest. Does that make sense? Mm. 
So they, so they at least trust that. Later on, they work out whether the answer is correct or not generally. Yes? <coughs> They're not invested in an outcome. Okay, yes. No investment. Now you think how often we ask questions that we've got total investment in, in comparison. Yeah. All right, so child, no investment in the outcome. A child is going, oh, okay, oh, okay. Like, there's no emotional investment in the outcome. Mary? Uh, just in the asking questions, they're very honest about the fact that they don't know or that they're in a process of experimentation. So they're, they're humble. They're humble. They're not afraid. Some people would call that vulnerable, but they don't even feel vulnerable. They just feel... Yeah. Trusting, as and in fact, they view it as a normal course of their daily life that they should have the right to ask a question, don't they? They don't. They don't. And it's only when we suppress them, stop asking questions. And a lot of you see a lot of parents, like when you're in a shopping centre or something, you're walking along with a child, like, "Daddy, this, Daddy, that." Can you just stop asking questions? Like, <laughs> and a lot of times that's the parents' emotion because they don't know the answers to these questions. And a lot of times the parents are not willing to say. I don't know. That needs to be in my experiment basket too, you know. Uh, but as parents, we often want to give the impression we know, and so we want to, you know, so we want to shut the child down if they ask a question we don't know the answer to. You've seen many of you have seen uh, children ask me the question, "Where did God come from?" Like, it's mostly children that ask that question, and you've seen me give the answer. I've got no idea. Is my answer, and. So it goes, okay, <laughs> and then moves on to the next question, right? Uh, it's very rare for an adult to ask that question because they want to have the idea inside of themselves that they would know the answer. Or it's one of those questions that confounds them and they don't like being in a permanent state of being confounded. Right? So, so when you experiment, you're able to be in a permanent state of being confounded on that subject until it gets an answer. And what if it's 10 years? Were you willing to be confounded for 10 years? Does that make sense? If you're, if you're truly open, you'll be willing to be confounded. So this is what the child does through the experiment process. Can you see why we don't want to experiment very much? Yeah. And can we just say something about, because we haven't listed the primary, one of the things. The child does not care, no, no care about mistakes. It's only when we punish the child, or punish the children, that it begins to feel a consequence for a mistake. Right? And once it starts associating pain with the mistake, it's going to try to avoid mistakes. Right? But the problem with avoiding mistakes is if you avoid mistakes, you, avoid, you also avoid experimentation. Do you, do you think that the average scientist gets out there, creates an experiment, and it works 100% of the time, every time, the first time? Like You have some scientists doing experiment after experiment after experiment for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, before they find an answer. That's a willingness to make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake until they get an answer. We're, that's the attitude we need to have in our life. Yep. Okay, I notice it's all a buzz, but at the moment, in the moment, I notice the kids aren't thinking about the future and not about the past. They're living as things happen. So they, they're in the present they're present in a discussion with the person. Not, when, as an adult, you think a lot of the times when we ask a question, we're not really asking a lot of the times the question that we really needed to ask. We're asking a question that usually is modified for public consumption <laughs> and has very little to do with our personal life because we don't like to mention our personal life. So what we do is we think, oh, yeah, the other day... Like, give an example. The other day... Yeah, you know, like, I really thought, like, I would like to have sex with that person who's not my partner. Now, I can't really say that in a public group and, and feel, without feeling judged and all these other things. So, so what I'll do is I'll say the question like this. 
And what if somebody actually has thoughts about having, you know, has lustful thoughts about another person who's not their partner? Now, can you see, I've now disassociated the actual question from myself. I've pushed it away from myself. I've, I'm already in notification because of my own judgment of the actual issue. So therefore, I, I've, I'm already in fear, right? I've already got an investment in the outcome. I've already, I'm already closing myself down towards experimentation. Does that make sense? Yep, this is what we do automatically. Okay, so now that we've got this on the board, we can see that what we need to do is marry or amalgamate these two concepts together. The concept of intellectually working something out and emotionally working something out. And we need to see that a lot of the times we are very versed in this part because we've been brought up with this part. And in particular, the part that we're the most versed in is these two parts here. That's where most of the world that we live in operates. I might just draw it again. Most of the world operates in this area here. These brand new markers are not very good markers. Most of the world operates there, in that area there, where they believe they know what's loving in their mind or they believe they know what's not loving in their mind and they act according to that every single time without any experimentation, without any further information available. Now, some people have grown to this part and you see this happening on a physical level with scientists in particular where they are in the first part where they are experimenting through an intellectual process. So they're already going through that in a physical layer. Most scientists are very adverse to going through it in a spiritual layer or a spirit body layer, if you like, metaphysical layer or a soul-based layer. Um, but there are some scientists who are now doing that and so they are willing to experiment intellectually in those regards. Most of us are totally inept when it comes to this side. The whole emotional side, particularly when we start, right? Because we've become so detuned from the childlike process of experimenting, we've become so detuned from our emotions altogether that we don't even or rarely even know when we're experiencing an emotion right so this is a this is a main problem that we have for many of us but I, what i'm saying is if you want to determine truth on any subject in the universe that's the scope and um, you need to do both things at the same time you need to compare these things because uh, and, and we can come up with many examples in a minute of how, how to go ahead with these particular experiments, if you like, of what's actually going on. Because there are, there are some general things that we can do that will help us to, to determine whether we're um, actually getting anywhere near the truth or whether we're still a long way away from the truth or not. Yep. Is there any questions before we proceed? Everyone's okay with that as a general concept? So it's a very general concept of how to go about discovering truth. Yep. Mary, you'd like to say? I was just going to say that, um, like, we live in a very postmodernist world which just says that you can't ever know truth. Exactly. And um, Now, can I just say that whenever we have the attitude we can't ever know truth, then it's highly unlikely we're ever going to experiment. <laughs> yeah, it mm. seems to me the ultimate way to avoid the first two top columns. It is. The f and it seems to me, t for me personally, to be driven by a sense of hopelessness or disillusionment where obviously this feeling that I can't ever experiment with things has just been totally squashed somehow or I've felt that past experiments have led me to more... Uh, uncertainty. Yeah. So that's why I'm very interested in And yet what does a child do? Just continues asking questions. Exactly. So your child always trusts that the truth is available. Yeah. Always. It, like a child never goes and goes, oh, 
the truth's not available, so I won't even ask Daddy that. <laughs> you don't see ch children doing that until they start getting shut down from their parents. You don't see them doing that. Why? Because they trust that the truth is always available. And I believe God put in us mm. this underlying feeling inside of us that we can trust what the fact that truth is available. And that we, we're sort of wired to we're search wired for truth. to find it, yeah. And if I look at the physical world, it's so obvious that yes. it, it, man wants to go to Mars and do ev everything to discover the truth of the physical world. Mm -hmm. But this, I suppose, this is kind of a spiritual wasteland now in terms of a feeling like, well, there's many truths, there's not... And for me, I find it for myself very confronting just to know there is one truth yeah yeah um, but i have to be humble enough to find it but the interesting thing is a child believes there is one truth on Inheri any subject inherently inherently yeah which is an interesting concept in yeah. itself you see that that's why i said in the first century that you must become like a little child to enter the kingdom of god because without these ways of seeing things you're not able to experiment so so you're never going to become um, a person who understands truth. And it seems, sorry, it seems to me also that the law of attraction is the, is the way for us to experiment. Like God's created a feedback system already. Yeah, I'd, I'd call the law of attraction a feedback system. Yeah. Um, it's not the way to experiment because you can experiment by not having yeah. things be attracted to you that are negative yeah. or positive. You can experiment by observing other people's <laughs> negative and positive attractions. That's one way of experimenting. So there are many ways to experiment, not just your own law of attraction. Yeah. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Sorry. Where does the belief fit in then? Is it an intellectual thing? Well, some of our beliefs are intellectual and some of our beliefs are emotional. And some of what we call our subconscious beliefs are actually emotional. So, so um, yeah, you know, it could be either. And, and the key with all of our belief systems is while we're unsure, we just need to put it in the unsure box. And then it'll become a feeling. Um, well, it's only system. when the feeling and the thought, and this is something I haven't yet mentioned to you, and it's something that I must mention to you. This area here is very important. These areas here. You could almost draw a grid of all of this stuff, right? The second point in both areas are very important to you. Because if something is emotional, harmonious with love and, and truth, and intellectual at the same time, harmonious with love and truth, you can be very, very certain that it is actually God's truth. All right? So this is a very important thing to understand. If that and that are both in play at the same time, then there's a very, very good chance that what you're now discovered is, a, is not only a truth about yourself but also a truth about the universe as well. Something that's a, what you would say is absolute truth. Yep. So the beauty of absolute truth is that it's always in this domain, in the domain of number two of both columns. Right? Absolute truth is always in that domain. Yep. Vera? I'm confused. So if you're feeling something inside yourself mm -hmm. and the feeling is that it's love yep. and intellectually you're able to examine it and say, yes, that's love. That seems like love to me, yes. So that's what you're saying, when the, when the mind and the emotions marry up. Yes, when you feel a feeling of love at the same time as you intellectually analyse the thing and you have the thought that there is a love of, uh, oh, here okay. as well. So, so for example... If many times we're not honest with ourselves, and this is the underlying thing that we need to be, is honest with ourselves. Many times people say to me, oh, I think that is the most loving thing to do. For example, uh, many people who are members of a religion tell me that it's right for them to excommunicate gay people from the religion. In other words, that it's right for them to, to remove a person who's homosexual from the religion. Right? Now... Now, and many times their intellectual thought is that that is the loving thing to do. But let's look at the emotions. What's the feeling they have whenever they think of a gay couple? How, how like, if 
they knew that it was unloving. No, what I'm saying is they don't know because they've separated the emotion from the intellect. See, what they've done is they've looked at what they believe is a rule book, they call the Bible or God's Word, and in there, in the, in the First Corinthians, it actually says that gay people or homosexuals will not inherit God's kingdom. That's what it says there. And so they've now intellectually accepted that as a truth without feeling about it. So they've blocked themselves from the feeling of it. Yes, because if they felt their feeling, they would feel this feeling of anger towards homosexuals, the feeling of wanting to punish a homosexual, the feeling, a lot of feelings that are present there in the statement. But they and might be feeling those things and thinking it's okay, because I think I've done stuff like that. I'm yeah, not no, in that instance, I agree, yeah. I agree. But what I'm saying is that in, when you're angry, are you loving? Obviously not. We can tell ourselves we are. This is where we need to be honest with ourselves. See, see self-honesty is the underlying crux of all of this diagram, if you like, of what, how we can discover truth. If we're not honest with ourselves, we'll lie to ourselves about whether we feel love or not. So I've, I've seen a person yelling at a homosexual, saying that he loves him. Actually yelling at him, screaming at him, saying that he loves him. Right. I can't agree. The fact that you're yelling and screaming means you don't. Right in that moment, love the person. So, and if, you, if, if the person themselves who is doing the yelling and screaming sat down and imagined himself or herself being yelled and screamed at, would she then or he then feel that they're being treated lovingly? I would argue with you that they would definitely not feel it if they were on the receiving end of it. They would see instantly that they're being unloving. And this is what we need to do. We need to start allowing ourselves to be far more self-reflective, as Corny pointed out. So if we're not self-reflective, then we are going to justify unloving behaviour. And we're going to tell ourselves that we're being loving, but it's only an intellectual thought. Now, I'm saying that what we need to do is be far more open than that. That's what we need to do. And one of the main reasons why we justify rage-based behaviour is due to our own addictions and this is where I'm going with this. So in the next part of the discussion, we'll look at the general layer of emotion that causes us to believe that we are doing the right thing when we're actually doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Can, I just, can I just get you to please put um, the stuff that here into the context of your own experience? Have you had to, how have you come to these? How have you used these in your own life and, and, and struggles? Or, uh, is, yeah, is, is that good a valid question. question? Yeah, yeah. Um, if I can uh, give it, well, basically, my entire life is built upon these six things. Actually, my my entire life, um, I don't ever hold on to an opinion as truth unless it is in this range of emotions here and intellect here. So I, I don't hold on to any other truth unless it goes into both of those boxes. Now, I can bring probably lots of different examples to it. Um, okay. Is there a law of attraction? Well, let's say at the beginning, all you're doing is asking the question, is there a law of attraction? Now, many people in the world would say, there's no such thing as a law of attraction. All right? But my suggestion is, instead of saying there is no such thing, you first need to go through and do some experiments. So what I do with my life is I experiment. So I go, OK. Firstly, I experiment with my mind. I go, OK, is this, if there is such a thing as a law of attraction, then the way that it's been presented to me by society generally or by people who think they know about the law of attraction is that... All I need to do is think something long enough and it will happen. Now, I don't know if you've ever put that into practice, but I haven't found that to work myself. Right? So after I did some experiments about that, I believed that if there was a law of attraction, then it had nothing to do with the mind. It's a valid assumption based on the experiments that I undertook <laughs> in terms of thinking something and whether it came true or not. And then what I did was I tried, I had to be far more self-reflective and humble and I had to feel about my own emotions. 
and, and, and I realise, OK, I've got some emotions about, for instance, emotions about money. Almost everyone on the planet has emotions about money, right? Most of us have a lot of fear-based emotions about money. So, so OK, I recognise I've got some fear-based emotions about money. If I deal with some of these emotions about money by actually feeling them and releasing them, let's experiment with that and to see whether my, my attractions with money change. So when I first started doing these talks, for the first five years, um, uh, four, yeah, four, four years probably, the first four years, I never received a single donation for the first four years. Obviously, I had some emotions about money because if, if I was sitting in an audience listening to a lot of this information, I, I'd probably donate just without being asked, right? So I had to look at that and go, okay, people appreciate the information, but, but, I, but I'm getting, like, it's getting to the point where I'm going to have to go out and work and stop, stop doing these talks, right? And I didn't want to do that, so I needed to look at my self to see whether there is such a thing as the law of attraction about money. And so what I did was I experimented with that. I went through some emotions and then tried to see whether there was a correlation between dealing with the emotion and an outcome, which was receiving more funds so that I could continue to do these talks. And what I found in the end was that there was a direct correlation. In fact, it often happened the very day that I dealt with a specific emotion related to money. The very next day I would receive some more money to do something that I wanted to do that I couldn't do before then. Right? And so I started to see, well, there, are, there is this, there's this issue of money and there was obviously something going on with my feelings attracting things, not my thoughts. And so now that I've done that with that issue, I can do that, and that's not the first issue I chose. I, the first issue I chose was to, with God and a relationship with God because to me that's the most important thing. But that was just giving you an example of how you can experiment Right? Most people are not willing to experiment right to the, the end. And when I say right to the end, most of you will not allow yourself to get completely broke right? in order to find out what emotions are inside of you that cause your money issues. So what most of us finish up doing is we get down to you know, what we feel is an acceptable buffer in the bank and then what do we do? We then do something physically to go and fix that issue up. Right? That's what we do. Because we're not willing to face the emotion of being destitute. Right? We're not willing to experiment with that emotion. Yes? So... So, AJ, do we have to um, actually get to the point where we're actually broke and have nothing to actually feel the destitute? Oh, the des sorry, the, yeah, that emotion that we need to release? No, we don't have to. Yep. But as you've found in your own life, I know. <laughs> you didn't deal with it before then. <laughs> Does that make yeah. sense? Yep, okay. So, so the reality is we don't have to mm -hmm. um, come up against a wall every time that we deal with something. But unfortunately for most of us, we don't, we're not willing to deal with something before we hit that wall, right? Is it, is it because, like what I found, it's the process of, yeah, it's the process that you go through which allows slowly the different emotions to come up yep. in relation, like for instance, yes. the money issue. So if you so think about my recommendations to you uh, and to Anto yeah. mm -hmm. about money issues, you know how you, you were so afraid to go and buy something because yep. if you bought something, you'd have no money left. And yes. then if you had no money left, then you didn't know what you were going to do. Yep. Right? And both being professional people, you're used to having a steady buffer, yeah. buffer <laughs> and a flow of money. Right? Yep. So, so this time you wanted to go and buy something, but you weren't prepared to go and buy it. And there was all this fear driving you. And, I, and my recommendation to you guys was <laughs> buy it mm -hmm. and then let all... Because it's what you want. Yes. And then let all the emotions come up about yep. not having any money left over to build on it, not having any yep. money. <laughs> you know, let all that. Yep. And as you've yep. worked out, th mm -hmm. that's exactly what's coming up for you. Yeah, but we don't have to get to the point where um, I'm feeling at the moment a lot of those issues are coming up for both of us. And yes. there's a lot of anger and a lot of, fe yeah, a lot yep. of fear about it. But yep. Yeah, but we don't have to get to the point where if we've got zero in the account to deal with 
to deal with that emotion? Do you know well, what I mean? Cause I don't well, it feel depends on a few things, want. doesn't it? Yep. It depends on how humble you are. Okay, yep. Because if you're very resistive, you might have to get to that point. Yeah, okay. Right? And <laughs> it depends on how much fear you have. It depends on how much trust in God you have. It depends on how much personal investment you have in the outcome. It de- can you see? Like, yeah, like, and the lack of faith too. I'm feeling yeah, the, yes. that's a big one in God. Like, yeah. yeah. Not so so yeah. for many of us, you, you see, we've got so many different emotions, right, inside of us. And, and you can see that one little issue, like the money issue, can bring up lots and lots of different emotions that are not childlike inside of us, that they've obviously been modified and they're no longer childlike. And as a result of that, going through the process will help us immensely to discover these emotions and work our way through them. Now, now how bad things get in our life is completely dependent upon how resistive we are to actually having these qualities develop inside of ourselves. Yeah, totally. It depends so on that. Just to keep, so just to keep focusing on our, yeah, on the humility. As, yeah, really. And the having no investment in the outcome, having which is, which hard. is very that's really hard, hard, isn't it? Like, yeah. You, you like when we talk about money, everybody wants to have an investment in the outcome, right? And I'm saying no investment. In it, that's what a child would do. A child, child's t- perfectly willing to spend its last cent, and not know where the next one is coming from. Why? Because the child believes that the next cent is going to come from mummy and daddy. Is that not true? Right. And then we grow up to be an ad- adult and what do we now believe? The next cent is not going to come from mummy and daddy. But who's your daddy? God's your daddy. God wants to give you everything you want. Right? But AJ, would you still say that... Um, that you know, as a child, if we've got that ex- still that expectation that our mum and dad will provide, we yep. could still have that as adults. Is yes. that, that true? So and we instead we expect society to provide yeah. or we expect we, what we do is we refer that emotion on to somebody else generally. So, so many of us have an expectation for something like unemployment benefits, for example, because, that, because, of, that, because of that same feeling that we don't feel that we're able to create ourselves what we need and without having to work very, very hard for it. Yeah. 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 Can, you, can you see the relationship, though, between the childlike state, which is this childlike state of child just, daddy gives it $20, the child wants to spend it straight away generally. It's very rare that a child wants to save it without having a lot of um, bartering with mum and dad about that about you know daddy goes do you want to put it in the bank do you want to put it? and why does daddy do that because because daddy wants to put it in the bank too you know like <laughs> and and but the child generally wants to just go and spend it because it wants to utilize the resources that are available to it instantly you see and if we were not living in fear we would want to do that all the time we want to utilise the resources available to us instantly. We don't want to store resources away because who knows what will happen. Tomorrow we might be dead. Like in, in the first century I said, um, there was, I gave an illustration of a man building up lots and lots of storehouses and storehouses and he got, he got his very biggest storehouse built and he died the very next day, very, that very night, I said, in the, in the illustration. And, and what good was it all to him then? You see, a child doesn't do that. A child... A child just engages the process of using every single investment it gets in a manner that's completely in harmony with no fear and its desires. And, and when we do that, we, we get to become very trusting with God. So, Ajo, when's that point? Like, what's the point when we get, get to that? Like, I feel... When all of these have gone. The struggle at the moment, like the struggle of that, of, I don't know, like, yeah... You'll get to it when all of the emotions that are disharmony with, in disharmony with love have been released on the subject of money. Then you'll, a, a feeling of peace will come over you <laughs> instead of you going, oh, what's going to happen in the next moment? But how many, blo- like, how many blocks do we have? How money? long is like a piece how- of string, Jane? <laughs> it depends upon you, your family, your upbringing, how your family brought you up to believe what they brought you up to believe, what society brought you up to believe. Honestly, if you were living in India, it would be a lot lower threshold. (laughs) Or if you were living in Somalia, it would be a lot lower threshold than what you currently have. In other words, they would readily accept these beliefs and teachings 
in comparison to yourself on the subject of money because they have none. And so therefore they've never had any to save and they've never had any to worry about. They've never had any to invest all of this time and energy intellectually and emotionally on. Yeah. And so therefore to them it's not even a problem. <laughs> right? So in the Western world we have a whole set of problems that are very, very different to other parts of the world because of these emotions that are a part of our upbringing. Yeah, so we just keep, yeah, you just keep. Yeah, the reason why you're asking the question is because you have fear. You are worried that you're going to have to become destitute before you deal with the emotion. And, and I'm saying to you, well, perhaps that is going to be required before you unlock yourself from the emotions themselves. It doesn't have to be the case, but it depends. Every single person here is very different with how they've been brought up, right? Even though we've all been brought up in a Western society generally here, we've all been brought up very differently by our parents. And so because of that, we all have very different belief systems about money. And as a result of that, once we start confronting them, it's going to be very, very different emotionally. Yeah. But can you see every time we... So notice the non-childlike feelings which are, I'm afraid, I don't have any trust in God, I'm worried about the outcome, I have an investment in the outcome. They're all non-childlike feelings. They're telling us the truth. They're telling us that, yes, there's still emotion there, still emotion there that needs to be addressed, that needs to be released, emotions that are out of harmony with love. Because if we are in love, we wouldn't have fear. There's no fear in love. So if, if we would go, go through each day feeling like, oh, yeah, you know, like bank account, no bank account, who cares? <laughs> it's not a not, and it's not a lack of responsibility feeling either. I, I am completely responsible for everything that I spend my money on, as you well know, right? So I'm not encouraging a lack of responsibility here. I'm encouraging trust in God. You know, God provides for every single animal in this, on this earth and they don't have to do a single thing. So it's the same with us, AJ. Like, it, it, we don't have to go back to work. Like, I'm just saying, like, things like that. We feel to get money, we need to go to work. But mm -hmm. I think it's because we haven't felt... Like, I know personally... Cause, yeah, because we haven't felt that, that God can give exactly. us the abundance. You know, exactly. Like, that we can survive just relying on God. Like, exactly. It's huge. Yeah, it's and huge. I'm not saying you won't have to work because, obviously, working is a part of the things you need to learn about love. Because if you love yourself, you'll want to care for yourself. So that is a part of what you would discover through this process, that I want to love, but I, but I wouldn't want to work in a job that I hated. Well, that's the thing. If we're working in yeah, you know, what our desires are... like. So if Vantu went back to being a lawyer, yeah. he would be totally the opposite of what he... You know, he doesn't yeah. want to do that. Yeah. He's never really wanted to do that. Right? And, and so if he went back to that, then, of course, he wouldn't be loving himself. He'd just be acting out of fear. But there is work that you can engage. Mary and I work pretty much every day, right? As most of you who know us well know, you know, there's very rarely a day goes past where we're having a relaxing day, right? In the sense of not, you know, some kind of work happening. And the reason why is because we love our work because we don't even view it as work, <laughs> right? So we're just busy every day just doing what we love doing. And when you engage a, some kind of a job with that passion that you love doing, things will come to you automatically. And this is what we need to learn from God and what we need to learn from all the animals and the, you know, what we need to learn from our environment. We are the pinnacle of God's creation and yet we act like we're the least important to God. You know, from God's perspective, we were the pinnacle of his creation and yet we act like, every single day, we act like God doesn't care about us at all. That's how we act. And yet, you know, we've got plenty of evidence that there's plenty of care around us. It's just a matter of us embracing an attitude or an emotion. Yeah. So, Thank you. so, so getting back to the uh, law of attraction question that was asked. So with regard to the money, all I did was e experiment with this law of attraction and emotions that actually affected the law of attraction with money, for example. And then as I experimented with that, I saw an immediate result. And therefore, I can measure whether I've actually dealt with something or not. And that then causes me to believe in the law of attraction. 
And it also believes, it causes me then to believe more firmly that if I look at my emotions that are out of harmony with love, it will always benefit my life. And now I trust that implicitly. Right? So initially I didn't trust that. Initially I didn't really believe that. But now I trust that implicitly because I've engaged that. My life is engaging that every single day and I get results every single day from that. So that's why I trust it implicitly. So, so you're saying that basically you adopted all these childlike things in your experiment yes. to get to the conclusion that you're after. Yes. So I, you know how um, the world is addicted to being adult. Like we, we put on a facade, we get all dressed up and, and we, get all, like, we get all flash and, and we, we're addicted to the facade. We like, you know, you know... Well, a lot of people are dead broke and yet they're driving around, you know, an expensive vehicle and they're living in an expensive home and so forth. They're working in a job they don't like to support it all and they're not, they're not living an honest life because it's nothing of what they want, really. They're doing it for, for emotional reasons. But, but if they adopted a childlike attitude, does a child live in a facade? Like, a child would do a poo right in front of you. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that you need to do that, <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, you go down the lolly aisle and a child will scream and it doesn't get what it wants, you know, and I'm not saying you should do that either because both things would be out of harmony with love, right? And the child does need to learn what is harmony, um, harmonious with love, but a child has not got this investment in what other people think of it. And then as we grow up to be an adults, we are totally invested in what other people think of us. Right? You think about how much of your life is planned around what other people think of you. A lot of our life is planned around it. And, uh, and, and there are whole jobs that are all about that, They're like the advertising job, the media job, public relations job. Right? They're all about, what are they about? Maintaining image. image, status, all these kind of things. We, we, in our society, we've, in, in, we've created... Hundreds of jobs invested in maintaining our facade as an adult. When we drop all of that and become childlike, everybody around us is totally confused. Like, I remember the time when we had Channel 7 come and stay with us for a couple of days. You know, the, these were the guys who finished up doing the Today Tonight show that lied about us the entire time, pretty much. And anyway, they came along and I said to them, look, before you film... I want to have a copy of everything that you film. And they agreed with that before they began filming. And I knew, even in that moment, that they would not do it. But I trusted their agreement. Right? So I trusted them. Even though I knew, based on their emotional condition, that I could feel from them that they probably wouldn't do that. Then we engaged the process. And I remember sitting down out the front of our house and doing an interview with one of them. And I said to him, you know, I am giving you an opportunity right now to act more lovingly. He's a minister, this guy. He was doing an interview with me and he was, he's a minister a church, of a, it was a Nighting Church. Yeah. Minister, I think, is a Nighting Church. Yes. And he's also a member of the media, right? So, interesting combination. And... Um, and he, he was asking me a series of questions. And I said, well, right now, I'm giving you an opportunity. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm giving you an opportunity to prove what your soul is like. Because I'm telling you everything about me. And, and you can go away and totally lie, or you could tell the truth. And I'm giving you that opportunity. Right now, I'm giving you that opportunity. So in that state, I was childlike. I had no investment in the outcome. I could still love the man, right? Now, as it happens, they took that opportunity and instead of presenting anything honest, they completely manipulated everything into being completely dishonest, right? And like, right down to, we have no fences around our property, myself and Mary's property. We've got two of our front fence and our side fence have all been taken down. The reason why we took them down was because there were occasional sugar gliders that were landing in the barbed wire fences. And so we just took down all of our fences right, around their property. 
everyone, we live in a farming community, so that's pretty unusual. Instead of putting in fences, like we're taking out the fences. And um, they took a photograph of a barbed wire fence and called it our compound. Right? These were two guys who lived with us for two days, who we fed, we prepared meals for all through that time. This gives you an indication of their decision-making in their soul, right? But, but now if they were childlike, they would have just been curious, open, transparent. They wouldn't be trying to have an investment on the outcome. But you see, when they began the interview with us, they already had an investment. They already had the angle, all decided. Right? They already had it all set down. And so they weren't in a childlike mode straight away. But they were interacting with a person who's in a childlike mode all the time, which is very confusing actually for them. Right? And so quite often they're saying, but, but what's the angle? And I say, what angle? There's no angle. Like, like they, they ask me about, like, what did I receive donations-wise? So I, get out, I go out and show them what, you know, I told them exactly the donations that we received on that particular weekend that they were with us. And then I told them what we spent it on because we actually spent more money that weekend than... <laughs> Sometimes it would I do. <laughs> and, and then we actually got in as donations. Right? And I realised that they have these ed editing, you know, where they can edit this and edit that, and chop this, chop that, and put this together and make it sound like I'm saying something completely different. And that's okay. If I have no investment, that's okay. That All that is to me is a demonstration of their lack of love. So I, said, so I said to this minister, you are proving, not only to me, but also to the world, because you're doing something that's public, that's probably being shown to the world, you're going to prove whether you're loving or not to everybody. You're going to prove whether you're truthful or not to everybody through this process. And I'm giving you the opportunity, because I love you, I'm giving you the opportunity to take that choice. So... What choice are you going to make, is what I asked him. Mary? I was just reflecting on the six um, mm -hmm. things you have in the boxes behind you, mm -hmm. because obviously I was involved in that experience as well. Mm -hmm. And I took the same approach as you. I was very open and honest, and I didn't hide anything about us or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or even about what I felt from them and what I felt their desires were. Mm -hmm. um, so we even told them what we felt their desires were in the process. Yeah, I yeah. felt, look, you know, you're not going to paint me to be a rational human being, are you? You're going <laughs> to make me look like a nut job. Yeah. And they didn't really even deny that. No. Um, however, I was just reflecting on my emotions and love. Yep. Because when that went to air, I can't say I had no investment. I felt pain. I felt pain that people were lying about us. So yeah. how do I then discern, how do I grow in love? Like obviously it wasn't the truth that I was completely childlike with them. So these are the domain of pain, aren't they? Yeah. These emotions here. Yeah. And the sometimes domain of pain. the first one too feels painful oh, to yes, me. Yes, this can also be a painful <laughs> process because yeah. of course we can make mistakes and sometimes we can feel the mistakes as pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, this can also be a painful process too, where we actually take an intellectual decision, experiment with it, and experiment in the wrong direction, and in the end end up with a bit of pain. You, can you see you've got to have no investment on whether you're going to have pain or not? Yeah. Right? So, so, and that's what I guess me. I had the intellectual thought of what would love do in this situation. So I was guided by that. So and you I, tried to be that. Yes. Yes. And so, and but I weren't did, always that. If I you're wasn't honest. always that. <laughs> yeah. At times, I felt quite confronted. Yes. Um, but I endeavoured to use my intellect to follow the loving path. Yes. And obviously, it wasn't emotional because I wouldn't have become a so defensive hurt. or hurt or whatever. Yeah. Um, so then that's using my intellect to act in harmony with love. And the beauty of doing that, that would, yeah. is that it brought up emotions. Yes. And it, and it demonstrated to you all of the emotions inside of you that were out of harmony with love. Like, so, so, for example, the emotion about investment in people's opinion. Yeah. What would you call that? Um, uh, well, approval, approval, wanting approval. Emotions of wanting approval from the world. And acceptance. acceptance. 
in, injustice. It brought up injustice. Injustice. It also brought up a whole process where I questioned myself. When so, so many people where you've doubted yourself, doubt of self, but that's more of a fear about well, whether yeah, you're right. it sort of exposed fears in me. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. All sorts of things. Yeah. So the beauty of engaging this process intellectually, acting like this, even though you're just trying to initially, is that eventually it exposed the emotions here, the painful emotions, that were out of harmony with love anyway, which is the beauty of the process. Every process has this power. Yeah. And that way, in this now, in this moment, yeah. obviously... There's an irony that we're talking about this right now. I feel more in the, the emotional place yes. of m acting lovingly yes. with more trust. And you're getting to be more here, aren't you? More yeah. where you're prepared to feel pain and you're prepared to experiment. You're prepared to make mistakes. You're prepared to look bad if it means even looking bad and so forth, yeah. right? Which is a part of that process, yeah. Thanks, Fab, for doing that. Thanks. I actually made a point of looking at that on YouTube yep. um, because I met a family member. Well, a family member is a friend. Yeah. And towards the end, I could actually see that the Reverend was very invested in the outcome. Yes. And I, I tried very hard to look at this openly mm -hmm. as a new Divine Path person. Mm -hmm. And they did say a lot of things that were unflattering mm -hmm. and I intuited to be untrue because they didn't compute with anything that I'd felt or heard yeah. watching your DVDs, mm -hmm. which is the only way I'd met you prior to today. Yeah. But I did feel, particularly at the end, when you invited this person to come back and see you again in, say, 10 years or earlier, yeah. and he said, sort of guffawed and said, well, not likely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he really did himself a disservice yeah. because that made it very clear that he was biased. Yeah, and the sad thing is that in 10 years' time he's going to desperately want to talk to me <laughs> and he's going to have to get over that emotion, unfortunately, of how much he ridiculed the idea 10 years earlier to even do it. Publicly. Yeah, publicly to even do it. And, and yes, I've, I feel with every interaction we have the opportunity to learn more about love and ourselves with every single interaction. And the beauty of engaging any interaction with this kind of attitude is that eventually it will expose our own pains and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to expose your own pain. It's a good thing to expose your own pain because once it's exposed, you can release it. Once you can release it, you no longer carry it around. It no longer affects the rest of your life. So it's very important that your own pain is eventually exposed. And it also opens you more up to this idea that you can experiment. You can, you can start going through not only just intellectually experiment, but you can experiment with your emotions, not just with your thoughts. Right? And most of us are very, very unhappy about experimenting with our emotions. We want every emotion to be happy. Right? When it's not happy, we're very unhappy. And we don't want to experiment with that feeling either. We don't want to feel that feeling or experiment with that. We're, we're usually a bit more happier to experiment with thoughts. You know, that's why scientists are completely happy to go through the experimentation process with their thoughts, right? They're usually happier to do that. When it comes to experimenting here, that's where we're normally very, very blocked. Right? So if Um, AJ, I, since um, listening to you or um, listening to your teachings, I try to um, apply your concepts to my own life as, mm -hmm. as my experiment. Um, and I can see with one and three, I can, I can see where, it, where certainly that applies to my life. Um, but I'm trying to get a sense of whether I've ever experienced the middle um, grid. Part this of area grid. here? Yeah, that area there. Yeah, it's um, a very difficult area. There are times where um, 
I feel an emotion that seems to arise spontaneously and, follow, and on the heels of that emotion there is a thought mm -hmm. that, that I feel is a truth. Mm -hmm. I guess some people call it an aha moment but mm -hmm. it seems to be deeper than that. Yes. Um, so I just want to know, is that what you mean, is that an example of that middle area? Just so I can recognise it again if it ever happens. Uh, yes. <laughs> what happens initially when we go through this process of opening ourselves up and becoming childlike again is that we generally have only moments in time where we have these things happen. Well, short moments in time where they might last a few minutes, sometimes even just a few seconds initially. Yeah? And we need to recognise them for what they are. We need to recognise them as moments where our soul has embraced a truth and, and that we've not only thought it but we've also felt it as a truth. And these moments are very, very important to our um, future development. In fact, they, they are like building blocks to the rest of our foundation. What happens as you progress is there is generally a cycle in, in terms of how, what, thing, what things happen. Initially, we start off uh, in our progression thinking we know everything and actually knowing nothing. Do you understand that? That's where we generally start. So we think we know everything and we actually know very little is where we start. Then what happens is those two points slowly converge and usually what happens is the thinking we know everything eventually comes down into realising that we know nothing or very little. That is what I call a very special moment actually. It's a, it's a moment now where we've learnt to be far more humble in terms of recognising our true self, right? Now we will start to go through processes which involve both our intellect and our emotions which cause us to analyse this condition and work upon it, if we desire to work upon it. So it's one thing to know that you know nothing, quite another thing to desire to know everything. So we can know everything, like I've, like I've stated. So, so, but, but it has to be every. We have to do a number of different things to do that, like connection with God is one of those important things, connection with ourselves. We need to be connected with our emotions and our intellect at the same time. There's a number of things that we need to do. And that is a growing proposition. We can't expect, expect it all to happen instantly. And many of us do expect this. You know, we, we sort of go, oh, you know, I just said if I feel this emotion, all of a sudden I'll know this thing. And the reality is that is true. But, but, but it's not true that you'll know the whole world of things that you need to know in, the, in a moment. That kind of thing does not actually ever occur. Right? So, so what we need to do is grow in our knowledge of ourselves, of God and the universe around us. Does that make sense? Now, that process is going to involve experimenting, it's going to involve mistakes, it's going to involve some pain, it's going to involve confrontation with the world as we know it because most of the people in the world don't want us to do that and so we're going to have confrontation occurring as well. All of these different things will occur. Yep. Mary? So really, in the second col second box in the second column, the emotions that are harmonious with love must always be felt as truths. Yeah. That's a thing that's going to occur once we've been through all the other boxes pretty much, isn't it? Yes. So like with Jane, with her issues about God-reliance, say... With the money issue? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So she has to be very honest about what she can intellectually... Like many times intellectually we think it's loving to work. Mm -hmm. But we kind of crush our souls emotionally. And that's not loving. Yeah. So, I, then we so I agree it is loving to work. Yeah. But I can't agree that it's loving to work in a job you hate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then we go over to the emotions that feel painful and we go, okay, there must be something. It seems like a big feedback loop for me. It is. Like, so we feed back and we go, okay, I need to modify this intellectual thought that I should be doing this. Yes. So what would love be doing? Uh, so love would be embracing a job that I love. Yeah. So what I would do is give up the job that I hate and immediately, not, not put it off, embrace the job I love and see what happens. Yeah, and yeah. so then I go into the emotions that I'm not sure of the answer but I feel like, well, God would probably provide for me if, I, if he created me with this unique soul So that's passion. a thought? That's a thought, yeah. So that's a possibility only because yeah. I haven't yet known it as a truth. So then I... 
So I embrace the process. I've become open and transparent. Become and very things. afraid. <laughs> yes, that's a part of the experiment. Yep. The part of the experiment is to bring up all of your fear and bring up all of your rage and your anger and But your then I would say, then I would go to that box and go, hang on, this emotion is not harmonious with love, so I shouldn't do what it says. I should, I should let my... Yeah, so, so the emotion might be you, you embrace the job and two weeks after embracing this new job that you love... You've got no money. Yeah. So what, what's the emotion? Well, Terror. Well, it begins with fear, doesn't yeah. it? So fear-based emotion. So I know the fear is not love, right? Fear is not love. And I know that my fear is not love. So what do I do? I continue to embrace the job and feel my fear. Mm. So Because remember I said anything in motion that's out of harmony with love Fear is one of those emotions, needs to be released. And the only way you can release it, and we can talk more about this as we go, but the only way we can release it is by feeling it. So we have to actually feel the fear. But we still engage the job. And what will happen is when we release the fear of having no money, then we'll start getting some. Right? And, but what I feel is that very often we get to that point, we feel afraid, we go, oh, my experiment didn't work. It's all, God doesn't work like that. Yes, we instead give up the experiment go, just when it's about to teach you something. We go hopeless instead of fearful. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. We give up the experiment at the wrong time. Yeah. You see, we need to carry the experiment fully through, right the way through the emotion. And we need to use our, it seems to me, we need to use our intellect to. To, because emotionally nothing's... Emotionally... It's, it's our, all stirred up. Emotionally, inside we're screaming at ourselves <laughs> going, stop, stop this insanity, stop, stop. Emotionally, that's what we're doing. <laughs> yep. Yes. So but but intellectually we we're going, intellect no, 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 no. We're looking at the emotion, we're going, no, that's an emotion out of harmony with love because it's fear. Yep. And I know that anything that's out of harmony with love must be addressed and must Should be released. Be released I've got to be yeah. f- and the way I release it is by feeling it. So I have to feel it without acting upon it. Yeah without deciding to act in harmony with how the emotion is dictating me to act. Yeah. If I know I love the job, I stay with loving the job. And that, to me, that makes it a whole network of discovering truth then. And yes. I need to, this is the synthesis you're talking about, isn't it? I need to be able to engage both sides yes. and go, hang on, my in- I know this, I know in box one or in box three, I'm sure, oh, sorry, two, in box three, I'm sure that... Love is like this. Yep. So when I'm feeling something, I have to remember it's an error. Yeah, yep. sorry. Random. Exactly. I'm so so what we need to do is we need to stop just responding to every emotion because many of our emotions are going to be out of harmony with love and we need to stop responding to them. We need to feel them but not respond to them. Do you understand the difference? Responding to them is living in them. Feeling them is just feeling them pass through you. So... Feel terrified? Feel terrified. Let yourself feel terrified, but don't change your action just because you're terrified unless you're in a life-threatening situation. Right? Don't change your action. And most of the time our fear comes up way out of harmony with what the actual environment is saying like most of the time. Do, do you understand the difference? Like, so, so we need to embrace the process, and as we embrace the process, these... Whenever we get out of harmony with a childlike state, we know we're in error straight away. As soon as we're out of harmony with the childlike state, we are in error. We know we're in error. And so intellectually we can go, I know I'm in error. Emotionally you might feel, no, damn this, no, no. Emotionally you might be saying, no, I've got to go and get a job. I've got to go and get a job. I've got to go and get a job. Like, I have to do it. I have to do it. Like, that's emotionally what's screaming at you. But intellectually you can still observe that emotion and go, yeah, yeah. You're just in error still <laughs> because once you release this emotion, it w- this panic will be gone from you. This, this panic and terror will be gone. So what about if you have the opposite injury, which is, no, I don't, I don't think that I should have to work. Like I, I've grown up in a family where a lot of things were done for me and I feel like I, I'm entitled to expect. So that. you experiment with that. You sit yeah. home on your bum <laughs> and you don't work. There's and no terror. There's just there's no terror. Kicking I'm not, back. I'm just kicking back, relaxing. 
and eventually my house gets taken away from me, my car gets taken away from me, I can't go anywhere, I can't do anything, everything's taken away from me. And I'm sitting there and I'm still pondering, no, I still feel I'm in harmony with love. <laughs> still feel, obviously not. You know, well, so. by then you're probably getting angry, aren't you? Well, exactly. Yeah. By then you're getting angry, the expectations are coming up, the demand that society meets your addictions comes up. And so by then you're already starting to address some of the reasons why you sat on your backside doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But can you see either way, we've got to be willing to experiment. Yeah. Right, so that, that's the important thing. Yes? Yeah. 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 Now, have we um, I, like, I'm getting a lot of this intellectually. And I've realised that I live, breathe, eat, sleep, anger and fear. Apart yep. from a few little aha moments where I think... Yeah, puff ton a tiny, tiny little bit of love. I'm the, you know, and intellectually I know can, that the process... Can I just stop you a bit? So you said you eat, sleep, breathe, yeah. <laughs> anger and fear. Yeah. Can I, before you go with your next part, this is a very good state. Because, because remember you started it off... It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good, no. But it is a very good state. Remember you started off believing you had no fear and you had no anger. And now at least you know the truth. And that is no, anger and fear dictates a lot of my life. That is the truth. Yeah. And, and knowing that truth is very, very powerful because now you have the ability to change. If you, if you didn't know that truth, you would never change. So, so you're at the state now where I feel, you know, I, I talked about the converging points. There was a point of what we believe. That says believe. And then there's the point of what we actually are, what is real or actual. And what's happened is those two points now for you have started to converge. This is progress. <laughs> this is called progress. Now, uh, unfortunately, though, the reason the world itself doesn't view it as progress, you see. So everybody else judges that as a lack of progress. But no, no, this is progress. This is true progress because now we've come to terms with what, we really drives us. And this is wonderful. You need to see it as wonderful. Yeah, I will. When yeah. I've worked through it. You will after um, you've gone through the emotion of it, yes. So let's proceed with your the, question. The, the thing is, and intellectually I also understand that, like, I've done some processing. Yes. And I know it works. Yes. And I've, I've tried to do anger. Mm -hmm. Now, I injure myself every time. Yes. And a lot of it's been coming up for me. Yes. And, and I'm sitting in it and I think, what, what's stopping you? Why aren't you... I know the process. I know what to do. It's and a I very good question, what's stopping you. So let's answer it. Has everyone got that? Can I rub that off? Because we need to do some more diagrams now. Okay. I want to leave that childhood stuff, childlike stuff there if I can. So mistakes, questions, leave that there. Okay. To process any emotion, we need to understand its dynamics. In other words, how it gets created. That makes sense, doesn't it? If we understand how it gets created, then we have a chance to process it. So let's, uh, let's look at all of our emotions and how they get created. During our childhood, grief <coughs> is a fairly common emotion, actually. Because any time that, we, um, any time that our parents suppress us, we will experience some feelings of not being loved. And any time our parents go into rage or anger or fear we will feel the feelings of not being loved. Does that make sense? Now, because we feel those feelings of not being loved, every single time there'll be some pain. Because whenever we're not loved, pain is always uh, an associated emotion. So grief is something, and underlying everything is a underlying grief that we weren't loved somehow. That starts everything. But what happens is that we were taught to suppress our grief, usually by being punished. So for most of us, we were punished in some way whenever we experienced grief. 
So usually we got a belting or we were told to shut up. There was anger. Often it was a combination of anger and a belting. <laughs> Whenever a child has a good cry, that's generally the result. So the next layer of emotions that we learn to live through are fear, fear-based emotions. Does that make sense so far? Then what we do is we don't like feeling fear because feel feels fear is a terrible feeling to feel. It's one of the most difficult emotions actually for most people to feel. And so what we do is we enter into addictions in order to avoid the fear. You're right with us so far? So now we've got a layer of addictions that are inside of us and the addictions can be physical. So in other words, they could be drink, smoke, smoking, drugs, whatever, right? sex, whatever. It can be emotional addictions. And emotional addictions are things like, I'll do this for you if you do that for me. You want, want other people to think you feel good. You know, want other people to approve of you, to think that you're good, to be accepted, to be, you know, to be cared for. And there's all these addictions. We just have a long list of emotional addictions. We also have some spiritual addictions, actually, many of us. Sometimes we're addicted to not believing in God at all. Sometimes we're addicted to believing in God but a God of punishment. And therefore we create a whole lot of religious expectations as a result. So these are all addictions. Now, when any of our addictions do not get met... The initial response is anger. So anger is the layer above our addictions. Yes. So understand that every time you're feeling your anger, it's because you're refusing to feel your addictions. Yeah, no. Keep going, ask yeah, the I get the theory of it. Yeah, and no. I sit there telling myself, well, I'll watch myself, somebody hasn't met an addiction, I'll get angry. I think, right, your addiction, why, why this? Well, now you're feeling angry, go and kick something. So I do my back in and... Uh, Are you prepared to feel your addiction? See, these are all feelings, if I can just explain. These are all feelings, yes? Yeah. Feelings or emotions. All of these. All right? They're all feelings. To get to the next layer of feelings, you have to be prepared to feel the layer that blocks you. So, if I am in anger, I need to be prepared instead to feel my fear. And this is where you're struggling. Because you're not always prepared to feel your fears, to actually feel them. I'm not I, I felt a lot of them, I think, or am I still doing spirit fears? Well, no, no, I feel, you, I feel you're starting to get into this process. Because the, the beauty of what you've done up to now is you had what you believed you were like and what was real. So this is the bottom line here, what is really you. And now you've got to the point where you've recognised, wow, I'm just full of fears and those fears cause me to be angry. Now, understand though, the fears don't cause you to be angry. It's your unwillingness to feel them that causes you to be angry. So when I'm trying to be angry and I get really tired or I hurt myself or yep. um, do something else, yep. it's because I'm not willing to feel the fear. Yes, you, you want the addiction met rather than feeling the fear that the addiction covers to actually feel it. So most of our addictions are related to feelings of not being loved, not being wanted, not being accepted, not being approved of, and You've so forth. You've pretty much covered them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and what we do is we set up our addictions to meet all of those fears. So our addictions are like, if I have an interaction with you, I've got to be, um, I can't confront you. Because if I confront you, you don't feel that's approval. And therefore, it's not meeting one of your addictions. And therefore, it's triggering a fear. And then you don't like your fear being triggered of not being approved of. And so then you revert to anger. Does that make sense? There's a cycle that goes on there. And if we understand that dynamics, initially we have to understand it with our mind, like you've done. Now the step you're taking is to going into understanding it emotionally. 
Now that requires you to actually feel the emotion. That's the part that's hard. That's the part that everybody gets stuck on. Everybody. Not just, not just a wearer, right? Every single person I've ever known who's ever come across the divine love path gets stuck at the point of feeling their fears. All right, so I want to know what to do about it. Like, do yeah, I well, that, that's also a fear. <laughs> yeah, I'm still looking for my manual. What does the, chi- what does the child do? The child just feels it without the angle, without wanting to understand what it has to feel. The child just goes ahead and feels it, chooses to feel it. And this is, what we, this is one of the constructs that we have as an adult, that we believe we have to understand it before we can feel it. A child doesn't understand it, and yet it feels it and releases it pretty much straight away. So, so there's a process we need to get back to. So... So what you're doing is going through a process of releasing this adult way of dealing with problems and getting back to the childlike way, which is actually a very rapid way of dealing with problems. Now, I'm not suggesting that all children are loving, because that is certainly not true. What I am suggesting is the way they handle emotions is the fastest way, generally, to releasing them. Even their unloving ones. Now, I've given you examples of this before where... I've seen a child, like, come up and hit somebody. Like, just a few weeks ago, we were staying with a couple, and uh, it was a couple of months ago, probably now, a couple of months ago, wasn't it? Where the child, um, and I'll give you another example, actually, just happened probably four weeks ago. We were at a seminar, and uh, this child just ran riot in the seminar, like, you know, distracting everybody. Her mother, his mother, just sat there doing nothing. Nothing at all. Just sat there watching the riot. She was the only person probably who could concentrate because she's so used to the riot that everybody else was always distracted, distracted, distracted. And then we showed a movie and he was back and forward, back and forward, screaming, yelling through the movie. And, you know, it was very interruptive, the whole process. So the child obviously not being very loving, right? So I went to talk with both her and him after the... Uh, after the seminar and and she asked me how do I handle like she recognized that the child's behavior was unloving she she could also see her own behavior was unloving because she didn't take the child out uh, while it was being such a disturbing and disturbing so many people so she could see her own behavior was unloving so I talked to her about that and then she asked me the question how would you deal with the child I said it's very simple and I got the little lad and all I did was squatted down like this and just held him to my body and didn't allow him to move. How many seconds do you think it took before he was screaming? It took about two seconds and he was screaming. And then while he was screaming, I was talking to his mum. (laughs) I was saying, see, your child does not like being restricted. He doesn't even like being restricted in a loving manner. Right? He doesn't like being told that he can't do something. He doesn't like being... He likes being unloving. He, he like. He, I, I said, now watch what happens. I let him go. He went up and punched his mother as hard as he could in the leg. As soon as I let him go. And she watched that occur and did nothing. Did nothing. And so I firstly addressed that, that she did nothing. And then I grabbed him again and held him again and said to him, you can't punch your mother any time. And I'm going to hold you here until you stop screaming about it. Because he, he wanted to go up and punch her again. So I just held her, held him, held him. It was outside of a public place and... She became so embarrassed because I, I held him for about five minutes only. Everybody inside the hall heard him because he was just screaming his lungs out. And if it was me, I would have just stayed holding him and holding him and holding him until he began to cry, properly cry, like grieving cry. Because what he had to do is he had to go through his addiction not getting met. And when you go through your addiction not getting met, you revert to anger and then you drop down into your fear and then you'll get eventually to your grief as a feeling. 
Now, I've done that with other children, and it's taken one and a half to two and a half hours generally of holding them, until, which requires a lot of love on your part, right, to do that without feeling bad and without feeling guilty and without... And, and eventually they've dropped into their grief, and after they've dropped into that grief, they never do the same thing again, ever. Right? Never do it again. Unless the parent reinfects them with the same emotion. Right? They'll never do it again. Now, most parents are unwilling to do that with their child. And you know why? Because they're unwilling to do it with themselves. Right? What do I mean by that? Most of us have all of these addictions in play in our life and we're totally unwilling to accept them not being met. Totally unwilling. We want every single addiction in our entire life to be met. That's our problem. right? And we think we should be able to get away with that and we can't. We're not going to be able to get away with that. If we want to become loving, we're not going to be able to get away with that. Because a lot of our addictions are unloving, both to ourselves and to other people. So what we're going to need to do is confront our addictions. When we confront them, we will feel anger. You will feel anger. Initially, when you first confront them, you'll feel like anger is the only thing you ever felt, <laughs> is the feeling that you feel. you feel. You go through this period of anger, which lasts. it can last weeks or months, and I've seen it last years for some people, where they've been just angry, 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 angry. And then recognising they're angry and seeing that the addiction's not getting met. If you're willing, if you have a willingness to face your fear, you will be a lot less angry. If you have a willingness to face your fear. But a lot of people have very little willingness initially to face their fears. So, so what you're saying is I'm making the choice not to feel my fear. Yes. So. It's a choice. Spot on. It's a very good intellectual realisation <laughs> to have. Yeah. The key is to translate that now into an emotional yeah. realisation of, wow, if I choose to feel my fear, then I'll never get angry again. That's a pretty amazing thing when you think about it, isn't it? That if I actually choose to How feel all of my fears. I make that choice emotionally? Like it, intellectually, I've problem. made the choice emotionally. I'm, I don't obviously clearly don't want to do it. Yes, I, and that's the case for most people. And so what you need to do is look at, you, look at the addictions and why you want them fulfilled. So, so Mary, you want to comment? Mary's going through this same process of error, so it would be good for her to comment about. Yeah, I feel there's a space... Um, where you feel the addiction. It's like initially it feels like whenever the addiction isn't met, I'm in anger, automatically my soul is just avoid, still so decidedly avoiding the fear that I just jump straight to anger. Mm. But it feels like there's a space where I can feel my addiction, like feel, emotionally feel you what know, it's is like, going on. If you could liken it to like a person who's giving up smoking and they badly want to go and buy another pack... You know, that feeling that they have. Or a person who's giving up drugs or a person who's giving up drinking and they badly want the drink. And, and they're pounding around the house, you know, looking for the cupboard that's got the spare bottle or they're pounding around the house looking through the rubbish to find the butt that's half smoked, you know. like Now, in that space, that's what we're like emotionally. We're the, we're the same as that emotionally. Where we're pounding around trying to get the... What we've got to do is be observant enough to see... What am I doing? I'm looking through a rubbish bin <laughs> for a cigarette. You know, like, like, what am I doing to myself here? Like, you've got to see that place and decide to not take the addictive action and instead feel what you're afraid of instead of taking the, addiction, the addictive action. Yep. And that takes a lot of self-observation to do that. Yeah, and it feels emotional too. I can, mm. Like I've done that intellectually and prevented a lot of my addictions, but my soul's still driving things. Mm -hmm. So it feels like there's an emotional place I get to where emotionally I feel like I really want this emotion from someone. I really want 
this thing and it's like an emotional realisation that that's not loving or mm. something and then that then my fear kind of Start, it starts to feel, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. a lot of times when we're getting the addiction met, we, we notice it, we go, wow, I'm doing that. Like There's this point of recognition generally where we go, wow, look what I've just done with my son, my daughter, my mother, my father, my wife, my husband, whatever it is who's close to us, my workmate, my friend or whatever. Look what I just did. That was just totally driven by the fact that I want to avoid the fear. And when they didn't give me what I wanted back, I just feel angry with them straight away. That tells me I'm still wanting my addiction met, right? So what, what I do is I acknowledge that, right? I need to acknowledge that I want this addiction met. Once I've acknowledged that I, get, that I want the addiction met, now I have the opportunity to examine the fear that's underneath it. Now, firstly, intellectually, I'll examine the fear. But remember, that was only one half of the equation. We've got to get to the other half of the equation, which is emotionally feeling the fear. That's when most people <laughs> go like that, right? <laughs> and they throw their hands up and everything else that are in their hands in the air and they want to give up, right? They want to throw in the towel, as the saying goes, right? We've, we've got to get beyond that point and into the point of actually feeling the emotion. Once you feel the emotion, you'll be surprised at how rapidly you can work your way through the emotion. But it will feel distressing because every error-based emotion is distressing to feel and release. Because you feel like you're giving up something that's a part of you. And it is a part of you. It's been a part of you for how long have you been alive now? We're like 50 years? So it's been a part of you for 50 years. A lot of these emotions have been like they were, a lot of these emotions were created within the first seven years of your existence, and the rest of the time we've been living in them. And of course, after 40, 43 years of living in them, it's going to be like they're going to feel like they are just a part of our very nature. And when 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 we give them up, it feels like a part of us is getting torn out of us. And it's going to feel painful. But once it's gone, now we will never, ever, ever even have the emotion to respond to inside of us. So, so anger cannot come up because the fear is gone and we've dealt with the grief on that particular issue. So the anger on that particular issue just does not arise anymore. Right? So there are issues that um, years ago I used to get very angry about and now... No anger at all comes up in the same situation. Right? And the reason why is once you've dealt with the emotion and released the emotion, it's like there's no need for anger anymore because there's no addiction anymore involved in the process. You're not feeling an addiction anymore that you badly want to get fulfilled. So the key is to be patient with yourself, right? which is something that your parents told you not to be. Right? And you need to be patient with this process. So yes, you've spent a lot of time learning about the, uh, the psychology of it, shall I call it, the intellectual part of it. Now you're actually putting it into practice. Putting it into practice is much more difficult than learning about it intellectually. Right? But the reality is that until you put it into practice, you won't really understand it either. So that's also a reality. Yeah. Now, what we, what we do with these, and perhaps what we need to do is have a break in a second, so I can, if everyone needs to have a break. So what we do with this, we need to discuss in terms of how, how this affects the other part. We need to put the two things together now of what we've discussed with this particular flow of emotion and compare it with those two columns that we created earlier about what we do with our intellect in terms of determining truth and what we do with our emotions in terms of determining truth and come up with some practical examples and situations where we can reflect upon what would we do in, in these practical examples. Now, the problem with any practical example is that every one of them is individual in nature and th so therefore cannot be applied right across the board to every single thing. So please remember that when we come up with these practical examples. Go back to the underlying theory, if you like, which is the two columns 
the intellectual side, those three points that we raised on the intellectual side, the three points we raised on the emotional side, this is the general level of emotion that is in us. Almost every emotion that we've got that's out of harmony with love can be fit into one of these areas of emotions, right? And so all we need to do is understand the relationship between these types of emotions, what's going on in our intellect and what's going on in our emotional self, and we'll have a great way of determining the truth of our life but not only the truth of our life but also the truth about the universe in the process yeah so let's have a break now should we have break till uh, four and th i know some people got some eats eats out in the kitchen so perhaps if we get those ready um is there any water out there too or are there, there's not much water out there hopefully everyone's brought some water of their own Hot water is there, and yeah, it's hot water. And the toilets, as you probably know by now, are just straight behind us in the area of the hallway in the hall. Um, and if we can come back at about four, shall we? And we'll continue with our discussion.